but um, David really is, uh, you, you can uh, see his bio, he is um, the Chief Diversity Officer for Comcast, which is something that is very near and dear to his heart. Uh, he made one of the most important hires he's ever made, and our board member and dear friend, Minnie Timaraju, who is part of David's team. Uh, and I have known David for a decade when I was part of the Democratic Leadership Council, and I spent many afternoons and evenings talking to David. And there is a quick anecdote I'd like to tell you uh, before he takes the stage. You really should just, uh, his bio is literally too long to read, but he chairs the board of that small uh, um, uh, community college, University of Pennsylvania. Um, he probably, he's, he literally has raised millions. Uh, he runs obviously a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, but as you, as you may not know, he was really the architect of the rebirth of the city of Philadelphia. And he was the right arm to Governor, then Mayor, and then Governor Ed Rendell, and who was chairman of the Democratic Party. So those of you from the Northeast know of Ed Rendell. And so David Cohen is really the model for a lawyer, public servant, and somebody who's a deep thinker about the party, a deep thinker about how you get things done. And there's an anecdote in Buzz Bissinger's book called A Prayer for the City, in which David Cohen features prominently. And they said his brain is so large and he sleeps so little that he, they had finally won City Hall back. And Philadelphia was broke. It was on its knees. People were dying in the streets, and Ed Rendell and David Cohen turned that city around, and you know how flourishing it is today. And somebody walked up to him, right, between the transition, and they said, David, Mr. Cohen, they probably said, you, do, you, you, you won't you get so many resumes, but I sent you my resume, uh, and I'd like to be considered for a job. And David looked at him, and he said, uh, your name again? And he said, oh, buff paper, left indentation, you live in South Philly? And he said, uh, yeah, that's me. He's like, yeah, I got your resume, I'll get back to you. Uh, and David, and I asked him at, at, at one of our conferences, said, well, was that kind of a, a trick or something? He goes, no, I, my brain just kind of works that way. He had literally reviewed 4,000 resumes and remembered them all. Uh, and that is why he has managed to accomplish so much of what he's done. The fact that he invested early in impact speaks volumes about him, uh, about the organization, and without further ado, so that he can uh, educate us about uh, his thoughts and also make his train, uh, my friend David Cohen. So, thanks very much, Raj. I always hold my breath when somebody says they have a cute story out of a prayer for the city, because who knows what they could come up with in that book. That's probably one of the most benign stories about me that appears in that book. So thank you, Raj, for your leadership. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks for being so nice to me with that one story. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to join you here today and a privilege for me to share the program with outstanding leaders like Congressman Ami Berra, Ro Khanna, and my good friend, Senator Cory Booker, who also has read A Prayer for the City, I would note. Um, so President John F. Kennedy used to say that in America, every mother wants her son to grow up to be president. She just doesn't want him to become a politician in the process. Now today, we'd have to change that quote around a little bit. We'd have to say every mother wants her son or daughter to grow up to be president, or maybe not. Um, but Americans' ambivalence to politics remains very much with us. Yet good things happen when good people get involved in the political process, and that's the message I want to leave everyone here with today. Because that's what's happening here, and that's why Comcast NBC Universal is an enthusiastic supporter of the Impact Project. I've had the pleasure of knowing two of, uh, two of the Impact Project's founders well before Impact was launched. One of them is Raj Boyle, as we, as we just said, we got to spend a lot of time together when the Democratic Party actually had something called the DLC to be able to encourage young people who might want to be involved in politics to get into politics and to provide some nuts and bolts training about that. Raj is an incredibly talented lawyer, entrepreneur, citizen politician, obviously chair of the Impact Project. And board member Minnie Timaraju found her way to Washington from her hometown of Hyderabad. Today, she is my friend and colleague at Comcast NBC Universal, and I was able not only to hire her, but then to convince and attract her to move to my hometown of Philadelphia. So I've taken her out of Washington, and 
Philadelphia is a much better city um, to raise a family in than Washington, D.C. Um, when Minnie was chief of staff for Representative Ami Vera in 2013, he was the only Indian American member of Congress. Today there are five, four in the House and Kamala Harris in the Senate, and we have political leaders like Nikki Haley, the daughter of Sikh immigrants from Punjab, a popular governor of South Carolina, and now our ambassador to the United Nations. But even more encouraging are those 60 Indian Americans running for office this year at the federal, state, and local level, 60. American community is spreading its political wings and it's about time. Your positive influence is felt in business, the professions, technology, and arts, even in the growth of the United States cricket leagues. <laughs> Indian Americans are certainly influencing Comcast NBC Universal. Our senior executive ranks include leaders like Nooper Davis, who um, I have the pleasure, unfortunately, of getting a voicemail from at least once a week reporting on some cyber attack um, and calming me down that it's not going to shut our business down. Um, Sridhar Solor and Devesh Raj. The NBC network has a new primetime TV show this fall starring Indian American actress Saraya Blue, and our TV shows produced by Universal have used the creative talents of Aziz Ansari and Mindy Kaling. But despite recent gains in politics, that is still a field where Indian Americans are chronically underrepresented. And this has to be corrected. Why? Well, there's a popular Washington expression. It says, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Indian Americans need to be at the table with a strong voice in setting public policies on issues like fair immigration and visa policies, civil rights, lingering discrimination and hate crimes, opportunities for investments in Indian American owned businesses and entrepreneurs. And as your chairman put it, to fight back against xenophobic and regressive policies. But running for office is also an expensive business. Back in 2000, the total cost of presidential and congressional campaigns for both parties was about $3 billion. That's bad enough. By the 2016 elections, that figure had doubled to $6.4 billion. And in this round of elections, it's widely anticipated that the number is going to be even higher. Nobody understands this better than Deepak Raj, who's chairing the Impact Fund and sharing his personal philanthropy and fundraising <coughs> skills. The importance of campaign financing was one of the first lessons I learned when I got seriously involved in the political process. That was in the late 80s, and back then I matched the profile of many of today's impact candidates and volunteers. I was a young lawyer with a wife and two small children on the fast track to a partnership at a large Philadelphia law firm and working the long hours that that path demands. I was interested in politics, but with everything else going on in my life at the time, my friends and my parents didn't think it seemed practical or wise to make the jump from spectator to player. But two things convinced me to give it a try. I found a cause I cared passionately about, and a candidate I believed in. The cause was the city of Philadelphia, my adopted hometown. Um, it had fallen on very hard times. By the late 80s, Philadelphia was suffering from years of fiscal mismanagement and occasional outright corruption. The candidate I found was a scrappy ex-district attorney named Ed Rendell, who shared my concerns about Philadelphia and he was determined to make a long shot run as a reform candidate for mayor. So I took a leave from my law practice to serve as Ed's communications director in the Democratic primary of 1987. We lost, um, but almost immediately started planning for Ed's next campaign as mayor, which came in 1991. This time I didn't take a leave. I tried to maintain my full-time law practice 
and also serve as Ed's full-time campaign manager. I have no idea what I was thinking. Um, but when Ed was elected mayor, I made the decision to resign my law practice and to join him in City Hall. And it was the eye-opening experience of a lifetime. Um, Philadelphia really was broke, um, teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Even though city taxes had been hiked 19 times in the preceding 11 years, the municipal infrastructure was crumbling, municipal services were deteriorating, crime was on the rise, racial tensions were high, and the morale of the citizens of the city was low. The city was bleeding population and jobs each and every year. But during his two terms as mayor, Ed turned the city around. That is actually the story of a prayer for the city, which Raj referenced. And even the New York Times, which has essentially nothing nice to say about any city not called New York, wrote a story at the end of Ed Rendell's term calling the Rendell-led eight years of government, and I quote, the most stunning municipal turnaround in history. Books were balanced, the chronic deficit had become a surplus, municipal services had been restored, hard decisions were being made, morale was up, the city was on the rise, not the least of which I might add is that Philadelphia was about to become the best restaurant city in America. And through it all, Ed ex exercised an incredible political gift for bringing people together, for creating coalitions. And it was my first in-person understanding of what living and helping to lead an inclusive organization was all about. And in this case, it was an inclusive city. So the Philadelphia metropolitan area has the ninth largest Indian American population in the United States. And Indian American groups were active in those partnerships that we created. I'm not even sure I know why, but Ed had a special affinity for Sikh Americans who um, lived in the Philadelphia area and were prominent players in a number of businesses, including the city's taxicab industry. And so um, on a per capita basis, my bet is that when Ed was mayor, we had more meetings with Indian American business people than any other ethnic group in, in the city. So I left city government after nearly five and a half years but I've never really left government or politics behind. I work for a company that has the same sensitivity and has the same DNA for the importance of diversity and inclusion that Ed Rendell taught me in, um, in, in city government. As a private citizen, you, know, you can look this up so I'm not disclosing anything, but I'm a registered Democrat. Um, and I've been an active fundraiser for Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and scores of Democratic senatorial and congressional candidates. But what do you know? I've been an active fundraiser and supporter for scores of Republican candidates for president, senator, and Congress, including candidates, no hissing please, um, like Paul Ryan and Pat Toomey. That's because I believe that for our political process to work, Democrats and Republicans have to work together. This is not about political warfare. That is not how you get sound public policy made. It is not how you make strong decisions. It's not how you build a country. It's not how you have an inclusive social, civic, or political environment. And it's not enough for me to stand in a microphone and say that to any audience, and I will say it to any audience, but I have to practice what I preach, and I have to support candidates who I think will reach across the aisle, will reach across to ethnic populations that don't look like they look, and will try to play a constructive role in moving um, this country forward. So my message to this group is engage. Please engage. Don't sit on the sidelines. Um, there, isn't a, there isn't a young person in America, not a middle-aged person in America, who I know of who thinks this country is great and needs no progress and that we're finished. Um, so jump in, figure out your own way to engage. You don't have to run for office to do that. I'm speaking personally, I've never run for office. I don't think I'm ever gonna run for office, but I'm engaged in the process. And I think by engaging in the process, you help to advance the political 
and civic discourse and dialogue that is so important to move our country forward. Yes, it may require you to give up a little of your privacy every once in a while. <clears throat> yes, you're not going to be successful every time. Every candidate you pick isn't going to win. Every race you're involved in isn't going to be in victory. It's going to result in victory. There are no 1,000 hitters in politics. But pick yourself up off the mat and try again, and your engagement in the process will make a difference regardless of whether you win as a candidate or whether your candidate wins or loses. So I congratulate Impact for encouraging Indian Americans to make that kind of investment in our country and in our political process. And speaking for everyone at Comcast NBC Universal, we're proud to be here with you as your partners and as your supporters of this effort. So I hope you have a great day, and thanks again for inviting me.